I am Dr. Robert Freyter. I was born and brought up in South Africa. I went to medical school in South Africa. You know, I'm, I have a company. It makes a product. It's a, a nice little product. It's used in many parts of the world to help surgeons repair things in the heart. It's a patch. We had the notion that we were so far away from the rest of the world that we had an obligation to learn as much as we can, as much as we could from the rest of the world. And we had many technologies that we had adopted and developed partly ourselves. We had learned the way to listen to the heart from the people in London, the way to take angiograms from the people in Sweden, the way to measure pressures and so on from Cunard in New York, and the way to analyze the way a dye passes through the heart uh, and the circulation at the Mayo Clinic. All of these technologies we had available. There was no career for a surgeon. There were only about three or four operations that surgeons did on the heart. So my goal was to become a general surgeon. I couldn't see how there was any career for me in, in, in cardiac surgery. There wasn't such a description yet. There were, there were pioneer surgeons who did that. One of them was Russell Brock, who was an English surgeon. And Charlie Bailey, whom I knew very well, was an American surgeon who, who did the first successful operation of that kind. The woman who was operated on had her valve opened and had become glued together by the process of rheumatic fever and it opened, it opened it up and she did well. That started an explosion. There was a large population of people who had had rheumatic valvular heart disease, largely of the mitral valve but also of other valves which was the consequence of streptococcal infections untreated, because there were no antibiotics in, in, in the 30s. From the first beginnings of rheumatic heart disease of about 30 years, you'd be dead in 30 years for sure. It would slowly but definitely progress and your ability to handle it would get less and less and less. We don't have to have a PhD to be able to do special things. We have to have access to the information and the willingness to, to stick to standards. So it's, I take great pleasure in this little company, but it's a very small little company. We use the profits that we make to try to develop new devices. Mm -hmm. And the new device we're trying to develop is a mechanical valve which will have the durability that a biological valve does not have, but which does not need blood thinners. And we may succeed. We've had sheep going for over a year already with the device in, without no, no blood thinners of any kind. So, uh, the, that's, you know, the, the company is, is for me a, a, a great sort of satisfaction. Uh, and the ability to go on trying to improve is also... <laughs> I can't imagine myself not thinking about the subject and not wanting to, to make it better. When I was finishing medical school, mm -hmm. except for the, with this blind operation with a finger mm -hmm. and a couple of other operations in, in, in children, which were all performed outside the heart, not inside the heart. So the issue was, I was going to become a general surgeon. Okay. And I arrived at the Mayo Clinic where my father had trained, my mother had trained, my new wife with me, my uh, our newborn son with us. We'd sailed by sea, by the way, to get there. We didn't fly to get to the Mayo Clinic. We went by sea and train. We worked brutal hours. None of us would ever not have worked those brutal hours though, because for us, this was our chance to learn. And we were immensely dedicated and committed to that. And I'm sitting in my room <laughs> in the hospital thinking, I've come 9,000 miles to learn how to be a surgeon. And I haven't seen an operation yet. And three weeks have gone by. And I said, I'm going down, downstairs, because they operated on Saturdays at the Mayo Clinic. And I saw on the operating list, in the operating suite, cardiac surgery. Oh my golly, that's interesting. It was a child who was the patient. And from that patient, there was a pipe. The chest was open, I could see the heart was there. And there was a pipe going from the heart, taking blue blood to a big stainless steel machine on wheels with big screens down which blood was trickling. That blue blood was pumped there, and trickling down the screen, changing from blue to red. Red means it's got oxygen in it. 
and that red blood was being pumped back to the patient. And I knew exactly what they were doing because believe it or not, in our physiology class in third year, the possibility of a machine to take over the functions of the heart was one of the lectures. It was an exercise that we would have to think, what would we need to do? What would we need not to do in order to be able to support a patient with his heart not working so we can support the patient's vital functions, brain and the rest of the body, all the organs, the liver and the kidneys with a machine. So I knew exactly what they were doing. This was a heart-lung machine and they were doing open heart surgery. So that was an epiphany. I, I, I called my wife that evening and said, we're going to be staying here longer than we planned. <laughs>